We have now reached the point in our introductory review of quantitative research where we can hopefully start to bring to bear some of the concepts explored so far in the previous four videos into our ability to not only read the research with more insight, but to take some steps towards critically appraising the research as well. This final video can only offer an introduction to this skill through some discussions, but hopefully it can act as a starting point to your own development of critical appraisal skills. Now it is important to realise that when appraising the quality of research, we are not confining ourselves to one particular section, such as the results or analysis, but must remain vigilant throughout the paper as to any inconsistencies, ambiguities, i.e. potential biases, which would have the consequence of possibly undermining the validity, that is the truth, of the research findings. Now all research papers pretty much have a broadly common structure. We can refer to this as the anatomy of a research paper. It's worth noting that in general, both qualitative and quantitative papers have the following sections in common. First there's the abstract, then the introduction, then the methodology, somewhere around here will be the ethics, then there'll be the results, followed by the analysis, and finally the conclusion. Now the abstract is simply a one page or one paragraph summary of the entire research paper. The introduction is where the research question is justified by presenting a review of the relevant literature in order to establish the gap in the evidence or knowledge base that the current paper is now about to fill. The methodology is how the research was carried out. This will tell us what sample size was used and how these participants were selected and covers aspects such as what outcome variables were measured and whether this was at only one time point or at different time points. Ethics, which refers broadly to protections and permissions. There must be a discussion of how participants were protected in terms of their identity and well-being. The results section is where the results are described. This will usually include some descriptive statistics, i.e. where the results are summarised into measures of average and spread, but no conclusions are drawn just yet. Next is the analysis section, where the results are explained or at least explored. This will be where inferential statistics is placed, if such analysis was appropriate to the study, and where the dreaded p-values and confidence intervals are most likely to crop up. And finally we have the conclusion, which is a summary of their findings and the possible impact of the results to the subject under investigation. This is where we are told what the whole experiment has led to. Have they discovered anything exciting? They usually have. And what impact this might have? Usually they think the impact is of importance to their community of interest. Your job then is to see if you agree with this assessment. It should be apparent to you already that in our reading and appraisal of quantitative research papers, we must consider all sections as fair game for our consideration. Above all else, as already stated, we are on the lookout for potential bias, generally unintended, but bias nevertheless creeping into the paper. Let me be clear, I am asserting that bias can potentially be lurking at any stage of the research process and therefore may be present, even if not overtly apparent, in one or more sections of the research paper. Before we continue, a few words about bias. You will have probably heard this term before. I don't want you to get too hung up on it, as there are a lot of different types of bias, and I do mean a lot. It is not vital to exactly identify the specific forms of the bias you think may be present but you do need to be able to describe its potential presence in a clear way. Now, just for fun, here is a list of some of the forms of bias that can occur in both forms of research.
OK, let's start at the beginning and, section by section, consider the sorts of questions that we, as readers, can utilise as an aid to our appraisal. We start with the abstract. I've already said this is where the whole research paper is summarised, but let's consider some issues that may arise just from reading the abstract. Consider, what is the sample size? If you see a sample size per group of less than, say, 25, then you can expect problems down the line. Essentially, it is less likely we can determine statistical significance the smaller the group sizes go, and around 25 is often quoted as a rule of thumb for a lowest reasonable group size. Note this only applies to quantitative research. Qualitative research operates on a separate set of principles which I am not exploring here. Next, consider what are the key p-values. Are there any less than 0.05? I bet there are, otherwise it is unlikely publication would have been granted. But how much less? The smaller the p-value, the stronger is the case for statistical significance. The following guidelines can be useful and are taken from the Open University Handbook in Mathematics and Statistics from 2009. If the researcher reports a p-value greater than 0.10, then they should be saying there is little evidence against the null hypothesis. If their p-value is between 0.05 and 0.10, then there is weak evidence against the null hypothesis. These first two can be read as there is little or weak evidence of statistical significance. In other words, any differences seen could very possibly be due to mere chance alone. Now we move into the range of p-values where statistical significance is generally concluded. If p lies between 0.05 and 0.01, we can say there is moderate evidence against the null hypothesis. And finally, if p is less than or equal to 0.01, then there is strong evidence against the null hypothesis. And these final two can be read as there is moderate or strong evidence of statistical significance. In other words, any differences seen are not at all likely to be due to chance and are therefore real in all likelihood. In the light of these results and p-values, we can now consider are the results or impact of the results, are the claims over-egged? In other words, is there alignment between their reported p-values and the conclusions drawn? I will discuss this more later. Also, is there alignment to the results stated and the research title? Had they reported more heavily on a secondary measure taken, which possibly did have a lower p-value rather than on the primary measure. This kind of cherry picking on the reporting can be quite common and is an early indication that their main research did not throw up anything they could claim as important, but they were keen to publish anyway. After all, in universities on both sides of the Atlantic, a lack of publications is considered a form of professional suicide. Pensions have to be paid into and mortgage payments met, don't forget. Do bear this in mind when considering published research. Now we move into the paper proper. The introduction is where the background to the research is explored. Here we expect a clear rationale for the need for the current research to be undertaken. We should consider the clarity and rigour of their background arguments, whose sole purpose is to convince the reader that this research was necessary and is not simply a repetition of prior study. We can also consider the authenticity and age of prior research used. Do take into account here the date of the research you are reading. Also, have the authors referred to their own prior research perhaps a little too much? We can next consider if there are any potential conflicts of interest, e.g. sponsorships, which have not been clearly declared. Sometimes a simple Google search on the key authors can draw this out. And finally, we might consider if there are possible cultural differences. For example, if you are reading a study carried out with Indian families, but the authors are beginning research done in other countries. Another example might be carrying out research on a multi-ethnic population, and so aspects of cultural competence need to be considered. We now move on to the methodology. This is the big one. This section offers lots of opportunities for hypothesising on your part. First, we must consider what type of research is this? 
Is this an observational study, e.g. a questionnaire capturing customer satisfaction? And note an audit is also an example of an observational study. Or is this an intervention, for example the testing of a new drug or a new therapy? For both observational and intervention studies, if it is clear that the study represents a snapshot at one point in time, then we call this a cross-sectional study. Or, on the other hand, if the study covers more than one time period, then it is known as a longitudinal study. Now be aware that both cross-sectional and longitudinal studies can be used in the design for observational and intervention methodologies. If we are looking at a longitudinal study, does this study run forward in time, e.g. tracking participants before and after some event of exposure, in which case it is called a prospective study, or is the study considering previous exposures and experiences from the perspective of their present, i.e. is it looking backwards in time and is therefore known as a retrospective study. Once we have a handle on the mechanics of their research design, we can probe a little deeper. So we might consider the sampling. How was the sample acquired? Was it randomly acquired or did they just use a form of convenience sampling? What are the group sizes and is the mix of participants across groups fair, e.g. consider the gender, age and ethnic background balance? If we cannot see this clearly, we can start to think about biases coming from the makeup of participants across the groupings. Perhaps they use some form of stratified sampling which ensures a fair mix of important groups. If this has been done in conjunction with randomization, then this is considered a strong research design. If any of these look suspect, then we may have an example of sampling bias. Next consider, did blinding take place for the grouping, coding and analysis? We can have single blinding, where the participants do not know which arm of the research they are in, and this is common in intervention studies where there is an intervention group and a placebo group. We can also have double blinding where those administering the intervention also do not know who is given what. This of course is only possible with drugs. Most other forms of intervention, consider types of physiotherapy for example, simply cannot achieve this. This point does raise an important aspect when you are critically appraising research. You can highlight, as the above example suggests, weaknesses arising, say, from a single blinding design, but it need not be judged to be poor research design, as it is a consequence of a necessary limitation. Next is ethics. Now, there may not be a separate section on ethics, but it does need to be explicitly addressed for any research that deals with people somewhere in the paper. So we need to consider... Did the study obtain ethical approval? When working with people with both observational and interventions, the researchers need to clearly address their attention to the mental well-being and physical safety of the participants. If this cannot be seen in the paper, how are we to rule out that some form of coercion took place, no matter how well intended it was? So, did the research receive approval from an authoritative ethics committee? Next, was there clear and informed consent, i.e. were all participants given clear information about the research they were participating in, and was it made clear their right to withdraw even after signing up? Next, we might consider, was there any dropout, otherwise known as attrition, that could be due to an ethical issue? Are there any potential issues around the possibility for harm, no matter how slight, and this also includes emotional well-being? Finally, it is worth observing that if a piece of research is so poorly designed or carried out that it is prone to bias and or misinterpretation, then we could regard its results as questionable and this could then be regarded as an ethical issue as money has been wasted and so has the participant's time and possible emotional investment. Next, we move on to the results section. All quantitative research should have some descriptive statistics presented, e.g. the averages and spreads of all the variables measured, as well as perhaps other summarising items such as tables, bar charts and pie charts, etc. Now when reading the results section, we need to consider if, for their measures of average and spread, do you agree with their choice? For the average, 
they will typically use the mean, median or mode. And for the spread, they will be using the range, the interquartile range, IQR, or the standard deviation. Look back at video 2 to help you with this evaluation. If their data was continuous and from a symmetric normal distribution, then their measure of average and spread will be the mean and the standard deviation respectively. But there are exceptions to this, which I also discuss in that video. If confidence intervals are used in their results, it is usually to be seen as an indication of precision for measures of individual variables. Remember, it is only when they are used to express the differences seen across groups that confidence intervals can be used to declare statistical significance. Where would you put their outcome data on the hierarchy of data types, i.e. nominal, ordinal, interval or ratio? This will help you with the previous question about their choice of average and spread. Of course, they will also be using nominal level data for their groupings, so make sure you separate out in your mind the two ways of utilising this level of variable. Go back and see video 1 to refresh your mind on these concepts. Were the results presented clearly or were there ambiguities or even omissions in the way these results were presented? A good place to look is their participant numbers. Follow these numbers as there is very often some sort of dropout due to perfectly reasonable causes, e.g. death or voluntary withdrawal. The gold standard here is often cited as the consort flow diagram, which I will link in the description below. Finally, had they measured other variables not identified as key from their research paper? If so, be on the lookout for these variables which often magically pop up in the analysis section as showing some sort of statistical significance when the primary variable has not done so. OK, let's now move on to analysis. This will only be relevant if inferential statistics was carried out. As explained in the last video, video 4, this is generally when an intervention of some sort has been used but it can also be legitimately used sometimes in observational studies. Now the big thing to consider is their choice of statistical test, which we covered in the last video, and whether statistical significance and then clinical significance was achieved. The ideas behind both types of significance was covered back in video 3. So, which inferential test did they use, and do you think it was an appropriate test for their study design? Are there any reasons to suppose they should have used a different test? Typically, you are looking to see if they used a parametric test when their data was perhaps really only suitable for a non-parametric test. Now, for a researcher to declare that their results were statistically significant, they need to have calculated a p-value of less than 0.05. This means that the differences seen across groups or before versus after, were unlikely to be due to chance alone. If confidence intervals are used instead on differences, then statistical significance can be implied as long as the upper and lower limits do not imply zero is included within the plausible range. Also remember, demonstrating statistical significance, p less than 0.05, does not imply clinical significance, the importance of their results. It is a common ploy amongst research papers to confuse the two accidentally on purpose and hope the reader doesn't notice. I've also heard it said that if really unusual tests are used, then this can be a sign of the researchers grasping around for any test that gives statistical significance. But this can only be thought about on your part once you have acquired some experience of what the common tests usually are. We now move on to their conclusion. How do they wrap it all up? What is their assessment of the impact or worth of the study? So consider, did the researchers clearly find out what they set out to do? Or did they seem to drift onto questions that felt secondary in order to promote good p-values? In other words, was it all worth it? And by the way, a null research is not a failed research project in spite of the well-known publication bias propagating this myth by the publishers of journals. A null result tells us something very important, and that is that the intervention either does not work or is too small to be detected by the sample size used, which of course implies it is unlikely to be a very strong signal. 
the research intervention is unlikely to have produced a very big difference. Next, is there broad alignment between what their results tell us and how they themselves have highlighted as its importance or impact? If there is weak alignment, like I said when discussing the abstract, did they over-egg their findings? This would be an example of reporting bias. Now they are not necessarily lying if the research is only of limited impact. Yet if they are claiming it's the best thing since sliced bread, then it is your job to avoid following their enthusiasm and bring a dollop of reality check into their claims. But don't be too harsh. It is only human nature to sing the praises of perhaps only mediocre results. You only have to think of all those parents we come across and their gifted children they constantly go on about. Everyone cannot be above average after all. Also consider the limitations of the study. Were these discussed in an honest, open and transparent way? Think about the more obvious limitations you yourself have identified. Did they acknowledge them? Examples might include low sample size, high dropout rate, limited generalizability, etc. And finally, what future developments or research do they recommend? As a last thought, I offer suggestions to various additional resources as these five videos you have just watched have only been able to give you a flavour of the skills behind reading a quantitative research paper. First up is the CASP tool, which stands for the Critical Appraisal Skills Programme. I'll put a link in the description below. This website offers a series of checklists for different research designs, mainly quantitative, but is now including more qualitative designs, and it is produced by the Oxford Centre for Triple Value Healthcare Limited. They are used widely by research students at final year undergraduate level as well as at postgraduate level. Next we have two entertaining and informative TED Talks. Again, I will put links in the description below. Both are by Ben Goldacre, a UK GP, a medical doctor and an epidemiologist who champions all things bias in research, publication and beyond. I'd also like to recommend some reading which I have found useful and which may also help you improve your understanding of the research process and the statistics behind the research. Note, these are books I already own, so I know in many cases there are more updated versions available which you should check out. The first is a nice little book by Ian Crombie. It's out of print now, but most university libraries will still carry it. It gives a series of lists, depending on the methodology, to guide you through critical appraisal research. It is presented in a simpler manner than the CASP appraisal checklists, and it too also covers both qualitative and quantitative research. Next we have Trisha Greenhow's excellent How to Read a Paper, The Basics of Evidence-Based Medicine. She goes into more detail than Crombie and also covers both paradigms and yet remains accessible and it is aimed at the undergraduate student. Third is the excellent Medical Statistics Made Easy by Harrison Taylor. This is more designed to be a dipping book. It only covers quantitative research but offers clear, brief explanations of all the key concepts including tests that you are likely to come across. And finally, I could not give a recommended list without mentioning the first and in many ways still best book that has helped me to understand the research process in both versions in a very easy to access way. Again, don't read it cover to cover, it's way too big for that, but dip in. It also has an excellent glossary. Later editions were by Pollitt and Beck. They are now on their ninth edition, but earlier editions, equally as good in my opinion, can be snapped up on Amazon for just a few pounds. But I wouldn't recommend buying an edition earlier than say the fifth edition. OK, if you've made it through all five videos, then very well done. I hope you can see that there is a lot more to understanding quantitative research than just reading it cold. You need to understand at least some of the key concepts and principles in order to stand a chance of some sort of critical appraisal. And hopefully this series of five videos has helped you to get started as an active reader of research rather than merely a passive consumer of research. Thanks ever so much for watching and listening, and bye for now.